Ladies and gentlemen, good day for all panelists and participants. A warm welcome to the Asia CCUS Network, the fifth knowledge sharing conference. I am Dion Lutfiana, a research associate of Asia CCUS Network, and I will be your MC for today's conference. Today, we will have representative from the Australian government and main CCUS stakeholders in Australia to share their insight on Australia's experiences on CCUS, followed by a commentary session from the Ministry of Energy and Mines, Lao PDA. Before continuing the main agenda, I would like to briefly explain about housekeeping rules. We will have Q&A session after commentary session. Participants can drop questions on Q&A box during the presentation. Our moderator, Dr. Han Fu Min, Area Senior Energy Economist, will lead the Q&A session. Without further ado, it is my great pleasure to invite Mr. Taizo Hara, Director General of Research and Policy Design Administration, Area, to give his opening remark. Mr. Hara, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you for your introduction. Good afternoon, members, supporting members of the Asia CC Network, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Taizo Hara, the Director General of Research and Policy Design of Area. Today, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to provide my opening remarks at the fifth Asia CC Network Knowledge Sharing Conference. In 2019 alone, about 33 gigatons of carbon dioxide was emitted globally. Carbon based products such as plastic, Chemical, cement, and steel industries still rely on fossil fuels as building block, and they remain part of our society, and they are, of course, difficult to decarbonize with renewable technologies alone. At COP26, many countries have pledged their commitment towards carbon neutrality by this mid-century. This commitment comes as a clear target of cutting the use of fossil fuel and make just transition towards zero emission. However, many developing countries may face huge challenge to decarbonize their own country's emission at, as fossil fuels as the main energy source. Any shifting away from fossil fuel will require dramatic changes to the whole energy system in which more clean technology and renewables will need to get into national energy policies and make the whole energy system gradually shift away from fossil fuel. However, the pathway to net emission will come at the cost at these green technology artificial carbon sink technologies such as CCUS and direct air capture and some renewable remain costly. Thus, making the whole value chain of these technologies to be affordable, essential, and keys for the future success of the current nation in development as well as ASEAN. Today, we are very fortunate to have an excellent collaboration with Australian government, especially the Department of Industry, Science, Energy, and Resource of Australia to bring in key experts to share their experience and insights about Australia's long-term emission reduction plan. Taking this opportunity, I will send to Dr. Dan Quinn, the general manager resource strategy, onshore resource division, Department of Industry, Science, Energy, and Resource Australia. I also wish thanks to three experts, namely Julian Turesek, executive director, project director, direct air capture corporate, and Sophia Humbling Wang, chief operating officer, mineral Carbon, uh, Carbonation International, and Darren Greer, General Manager, Carbon Transport and Sledge, a grain core company who will join us today and share their valuable experience from Australia of their work about policies on CCS and its value chain and direct air capture technologies. I also thank Mr. Soksa Hong Philip Hirvan, Director of Energy Law Division, Department of Law, Ministry of Energy and Mines, Government of the Rao PDR, who will make comment and dialogue with the panelists about the issue of CCUS and how they can be applied to ASEAN context. Once again, thank you so much, and I hope you will find the, con the conference very useful. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Haraha, so for your welcoming speech. Next, we will hear an opening remark from Mr. Dan Quinn, General Manager, Resource Strategy, Onshore Resource Division, Department of Industry, Science, Energy, and Resources, Australia. Mr. Dan Quinn, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dan. 
Uh, and welcome to everybody who's watching this conference today. Uh, as, you, as just been said, I'm Dan Quinn. I'm the general manager of the resource strategy branch in the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources. And we are the policy lead in the Australian government for carbon capture use and storage technologies. Firstly, I just want to take the opportunity to sincerely thank Japan and the Asia CCUS network for the opportunity to showcase what Australia is doing with carbon capture, use and storage. I'd also like to thank our three presenters um, who have been funded under Australia's Carbon Capture, Use and Storage Development Fund and who will provide us with some very interesting updates on their projects. Um, so we could go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so this slide shows you the overall picture of Australia's carbon capture use and storage policy landscape. And a key part of our policy objectives includes our engagement and our collaboration with other countries and also through forums like this. Uh, the Australian government is committed to reducing emissions by focusing on driving down technology costs and accelerating the deployment of low emission technologies at scale. Our vision is to increase global cooperation and engagement with like-minded countries and regional partners so that we can drive meaningful action to bring low emission technologies to cost parity with conventional alternatives, reduce emissions and create new economic opportunities. Next slide, please. As many of you would be well aware, we are seeing increased interest around the world in deploying CCUS as the way to reduce emissions. And Australia really highly values its partnerships with other countries on CCUS, such as Japan, Korea, and Singapore, and key networks such as the Asia CCUS network and, and the Clean Energy Ministerial which help advance the development and deployment of low emission technologies. Partnership agreements, such as the Japan-Australia Partnership on Decarbonisation Through Technology and the Australia Republic of Korea Low and Zero Emissions Technology Partnership are examples of Australia's commitment to working collaboratively to achieve our carbon capture use and storage goals. We strongly believe the government industry and international collaborations are key levers that will accelerate the deployment and advance the development of early stage CCUS technologies, not just in Australia, but around the world too. Forums such as these today provide a valuable opportunity to share experiences and provide opportunities for us to identify um, joint projects and also provide opportunities for these projects to showcase their achievements and their novel technologies. Go to the next slide, please. To support the deployment of carbon capture use and storage here in Australia, the Australian government is currently developing a national CCUS technology emissions abatement strategy to help meet our technology stretch goals and develop a commercial pathway for CCUS. This strategy will help contribute to the portfolio of CO2 abatement technologies that will be necessary for us to achieve our goal of being net zero by 2050. We will shortly be going out and commencing a broad public consultation process. And we, we're really looking forward to hearing from a range of stakeholders and companies on how best we can deploy carbon capture use and storage in Australia. Next slide, please. The government has also committed over $300 million to support the establishment of carbon capture use and storage in Australia in just the past year. <clears throat> $50 million has been allocated to a CCUS development fund that supports six projects, which you'll hear from three of these projects today, and another $250 million for a hubs and technology program that will support the deployment of commercial scale CCUS projects and also hubs. We are committed to expanding our own domestic carbon capture and storage capacity while considering the role that Australia can play in providing regional carbon storage solutions. We believe our competitive advantages in carbon capture and storage come from the vast potential of our, ge our geological basins may have for storage of CO2, both onshore and offshore, and our long history of developing tech the CCS technology 
and our range of suitable sites. We estimate that we have a combined storage potential of over 20 billion tonnes across four key basin locations in Australia. However, more localised site studies will be required to better understand our storage potential. In Australia, we are fortunate to have world-class scientific and research organisations working on this problem, that this issue with us as well. So the CSIRO or CIRO and Geoscience Australia. CIRO's CO2 utilisation roadmap, which they released last year, explores the opportunities that are presented by carbon utilisation or carbon recycling uh, technologies. CIRO is also investigating direct air kept capture technologies and developing technologies associated with biogas and conversion of hydrogen and CO2 to liquid fuels. Geoscience Australia is supporting the development of CCUS in Australia through the Exploring for the Future program, which is identifying new areas, uh, and the Hydrogen Economic Fairways tool, which is a free geospatial tool that allows people to explore investment opportunities for both green and blue hydrogen production in Australia. Geoscience Australia is also looking at the application of uh, CO2 for enhanced oil recovery in areas where we have residual oil. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening uh, and I'll now pass back. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Dan Quinn, for your opening speech on brief explanation on CCUS development in Indonesia, in, sorry, in Australia. Uh, in proceeding to the next session, we will have presentation and commentary session. That session will be led by our moderator, Dr. Han Fumin. So to, to start the session, I will hand over to Dr. Fumin to lead the session. Please, Dr. Fumin, the screen is yours. Thank, thank you so much, Diana. Very good afternoon to uh, all these uh, panelists uh, today and also all the audience, the participants in our network. I uh, hope that today's uh, panel discussion will bring the more practical uh, introduction of CCUS, also the direct air capture and also the carbon recycling and CO2 storage, which is very practical from Australia, which is very, I think, close to Asia. It's there, Asia, but I think this is the most practical that we can bring this uh, to, to be uh, applicable, applied to Asia countries. And we have three uh, uh, distinguished uh, speaker today. I want, want to introduce uh, first Julian Turesik, uh, he's the executive director and also project director uh, on uh, direct air captures from the corporate carbon. Uh, he's going to present on the solar power air capture. Uh, I just quickly go uh, each of the uh, speaker and then uh, you may have chance to present yourself quickly before your presentation. And the second speaker is uh, 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 Mrs. Sophia Hamblin Wang. She's the Chief Operating Officer, Mineral Carbonation International. Uh, she's going to bring a very practical uh, experience on a scalable carbon platform uh, technology that could be, I think, safely capture and convert this uh, industrial CO2 emission into uh, solid bio material and other uses uh, that you will hear from her directly because uh, I think she bring a great experience uh, in terms of how the carbon can be used in various uh, uh, sector. And I, I think from construction, go to industrial and other, it's very exciting to hear uh, on her work. And uh, the third speaker will be uh, Darren Creer. Uh, he's the general manager on the uh, uh, carbon transport and storage, uh, one of the clean core company. Uh, that he going to present the technical viability integration and safe operation of CCUS in the Surat, one of the largest back basin in, in, in Queensland. Uh, I think we learned from, from that directly how the CO2 can be safely injected and stored in that uh, Surin basin. And also the location very much advantage in that is it close 
proximity to other uh, uh, power plant that they can collect and then inject this back to, to the safe place uh, underground. And after the three presentation, I, Dr. Suksakorn, the director from uh, Energy Law Division, he going to make a short uh, comment on each presentation. I think uh, without further ado, I take this opportunity to invite Julian Turisic to make a presentation. Uh, Julian, the floor is yours, please. I mean, sorry, I knew it was going to be me. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fuman, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Julian Turicek from Corporate Carbon. For those that uh, aren't aware, Corporate Carbon's a private Australian carbon abatement project developer uh, with 9 million carbon credits created to date through a range of different methodologies under the Australian Emission Reduction Fund. I'm going to talk today about solar power direct air capture. As the name suggests, direct air capture is physically taking the CO2 out of the atmosphere. Uh, it's at concentration of around 420 parts per million. So it does involve uh, quite a interesting technical challenge. Just go to my next slide. Uh, so as uh, Dan Quinn explained, uh, the Australian government set up a $50 million CCUS fund uh, last year and awarded $50 million of uh, funding to a variety of projects of which Corporate Carbon uh, was one grantee. And you'll hear next from uh, Sophia from Mineral Carbonation, who was another grantee on the, on the second row of that table. Uh, so just to give you an idea of uh, the amount of interest and the amount of potential in the country, these five projects were selected from 70 applications totaling $400 million worth of uh, potential projects. So it gives you a sense of the amount of activity uh, underway and the potential that the government has to choose from to award these, uh, these projects. Uh, we're hoping to be uh, the first in the world to, de to demonstrate solar power direct air capture through to geological storage, uh, which is what we mean by DACT, D-A-C-T-S. Uh, obviously, uh, you may have heard of the Climeworks project in Iceland, uh, which is the world's first direct air capture project. It's got a different storage mechanism. Uh, we will be demonstrating geological storage in depleted oil and gas fields, which is uh, a large focus of the CCS effort in Australia uh, to date. Uh, the interesting thing about the funding is that it's match funding. So the government is putting in 50%. Uh, the other 50% will be funded by private interest. So corporate carbon and potentially other investors will be matching the government's funding uh, to, uh, to leverage additional funding to make the projects happen. Uh, since we were awarded the grant in middle of last year, uh, we've now completed three of the first milestones under that grant, which is a, uh, a global technology review, which I'll summarise in the next slide. Uh, we are very close to finalising siting uh, arrangements with uh, the site at Moomba, which is owned by Santos. Uh, we have formed a number of working relationships with potential hubs for future uh, DAC demonstrations and also identified a very interesting revenue stream in carbon removal, which uh, was actually identified in the CO2 utilization roadmap uh, that Dan also mentioned uh, that CSIRO had developed. And we are also seeing uh, Climeworks, again, taking this approach to selling the removal of carbon as a, as a service, which is then underpinning uh, the revenue uh, for, the, for their plant, for their project. Uh, we've completed a business plan and feasibility report, which will pave the way through to a final investment decision on the first project, which is a one ton a day uh, CO2 demonstration project in, in Moomba. Uh, so we're hoping to be the world's first so solar power direct air capture. All, all processes need, uh, like this, need energy. Uh, there's no free lunch 
In thermodynamics, you have to extract the CO2 from the atmosphere and that requires energy. Uh, the idea here is to use solar power because uh, Australia is blessed with solar energy, vast amounts of solar energy combined with a, a very large array of potential solar, uh, sorry, potential storage basins, which makes solar power direct air capture uh, quite a potential new industry for, for Australia. Uh, as we work on the first project, we're also thinking about future projects. So, uh, so, so securing some strategic partnerships with hubs. Uh, we've already identified our second project, which will be a two tonne a day project, and then also a, a 5,000 tonne or 15 tonne per day uh, project for project number three. Uh, all of this will require additional funding, and we've already uh, approached uh, a number of, uh, of investors that have expressed inbound interest uh, in funding the, uh, the program. Uh, so just a brief recap on the technology review, there's two broad ways of capturing CO2 from the atmosphere. Uh, the high temperature aqueous route, which carbon engineering, the Canadian company is pioneering there on the top left, uh, very large project, they achieve their cost reduction goals by going to very large economies of scale uh, and a very large sort of petrochemical approach uh, to, uh, to, to that process. The other method, Climeworks Global Thermostat and the technology we've gone with, all use low temperature physical or chemical or combination absorbance, whereby CO2 passes over absorbance, gets fully soaked with CO2, and then a vacuum is applied, heat or electrical power is applied, and then that releases the CO2 under vacuum. So all, all of the other three use that uh, process. Uh, Climeworks is the most advanced. They just uh, commissioned a 4,000 tonne a year plant in Iceland in uh, September last year. We've chosen to go with uh, an Australian technology uh, developed by Southern Green Gas, which is an Australian company using a solid sorbent called a metal organic framework or MOF. Uh, so MOFs are being used for specific direct air capture, uh, and it's uh, effectively like a nano design molecular sponge for CO2. The other innovation that can make this disruptive is making it solar powered, so completely renewable energy powered, uh, which then provides fossil fuel free, emission free uh, direct air capture. And the idea is to make lots of these modules uh, and then ar arrange them in fields very similar to the way utility scale solar PV is rolled out. Uh, as I said before, we see a, a, a vast array of potential solar, uh, sorry, potential storage opportunities. This is just a, uh, a snapshot of them. There, there's more that we could identify. Uh, this is a snapshot of the 20 billion tonnes that they've identified. But once you've captured CO2 from the atmosphere, you can store it, uh, as is our project objective, or you can utilize it in building materials as Sophia will talk to, or, or you can turn it into uh, synthetic and sustainable fuels, uh, which we've identified a project here, and there's other projects around the world, which are aiming to capture CO2 from the atmosphere, electrolyze water to get hydrogen, and then combine those to create uh, hydrocarbon synthetic sustainable fuels. The, the whole objective of direct air capture industry is to try to get to $100 a tonne US or under in carbon removal. And uh, at the moment, we are several multiples above that uh, in a sort of $500 to $1,000 a tonne range. The whole key to bringing costs down is to get large in terms of large scale manufacture and many, many modules, or uh, at the carbon engineering of projects is to, to, to get large plants and then scale them uh, as, as they build and learn through that. Uh, the learning rate, now there's a very interesting article that came out from uh, Lackner, who is the professor who has pioneered direct air capture. And he uh, has identified that uh, learning rates through this modular approach could be around the same learning rate as solar or even better than solar. So our whole approach is to uh, ramp up by getting larger and larger projects. As we get to larger and larger projects, we need to build more and more modules. And then that large scale manufacturer approach of those modules is what will bring costs down to that US $100 a tonne approach. 
At the same time, you can imagine that the carbon market, the value of carbon removal is approaching uh, $100 a tonne already. Carbon credit EUAs in, in Europe are well over $100 a tonne US, so about 120 euros. So the market is potentially there. We need to bring down that uh, cost of carbon removal uh, towards $100 a tonne uh, by, the, by the end of the decade or, or, or around then. That, that's the whole objective of, of direct air capture. And I think that's my 10 minutes or around my 10 minutes or more. Uh, so thanks for your time. Uh, happy to uh, leave questions uh, to the end or if there's anything quick now, I can address that. I'll hand back to Dr. Fullman. Thank, uh, th thank you so much, uh, Julian, for your very uh, nice and excellent presentation on the direct air capture from Australia. I think this is will be one of the promising technologies complementing to CCUS. And I believe that this will come at scale. And we, we believe that this technology, once it commercialized, I think can, can have to decarbonize at large scale. Because uh, CCUS itself, I think sometimes have geographical problem to store and other. If it can be complemented with direct air capture, with the low cost of solar, I think this will be very promising in in uh, in Australia as well as in ASEAN because ASEAN is a burden of solar energy. Hope this will be one of very good project we can discuss. So I think our uh, uh, participant will uh, prepare to have some question at the the discussion uh, later on. But I take this opportunity to invite Sophia uh, to make uh, the next presentation on the mineral uh, on these. Uh, uh, a scalable carbon platform technology that I think how we can utilize carbon into a various product and uses. Uh, the floor is yours, Sophia, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Fumin. So it's a pleasure to be here to talk about, uh, to share knowledge at the CCUS conference. Um, so I'm just trying to go to the next slide. Yep. So MCI, Mineral Carbonation International, uh, we are a carbon transformation technology. We're the U in CCU, where we're um, transforming CO2 gas into solid materials safely and permanently for use in the circular economy. And uh, th these are um, a range of products that we're um, that we're developing right now. And we have a vision to be a world leading provider of carbon solutions, uh, just as Julian was mentioning. Uh, before there's a carbon removal as a service, well, we anticipate there'll be uh, quite a lot of companies looking for solutions to store and utilize CO2. And we, um, we're developing a very scalable solution that uh, addresses that. And we have a mission to lock away 1 billion tons of CO2 into products permanently and safely by the year 2040. And we're well on our way to achieving that goal with thanks to the Australian government. And this is our team. Uh, we actually have just grown by about 15 people, but uh, I always like to just remind people that we're a group of individuals working uh, in Australia and all over the world, um, chemical engineers and geologists. Now, MCI started around uh, 2013 when we received um, a grant from the Federal Government Department of Industry, New South Wales Government and Orica, which is a mining services company. And we uh, embarked on the building of a pilot plant in Newcastle, Australia. And uh, that was developing and showcasing that technology could be um, developed to turn CO2 into useful materials that can be sold for a profit. So turning a waste material into a new products. We've been um, operating with um, Orica Engineering and Siemens process control systems. And um, yeah, it's been a, a really a, a great ride so far. We also signed an MOU with Itoshu Corporation and received investment from them, a cornerstone investment last year. So we're really, really thrilled to join the, um, the Asia group and we're looking at um, scaling our technology into Japan, decarbonizing Japanese industry, in particular steel and cement. And I'll go more into the technology in a moment. And uh, we secured $14.6 million 
from the Commonwealth Government, from uh, the Department of Industry, as we just mentioned. And that is to build the first industrial demonstration plant um, to, and to accelerate our global customers. So what do we do? So I'll just go through it quickly. Um, we take mineral feedstocks, so they can be mine wastes, um, particularly from nickel and lithium and coal, cobalt industries. Um, also um, mine um, wastes from industrial processes like steel slags, incinerator bottom ash and other industrial wastes that contain magnesium or calcium um, content. And um, also mineral feedstocks, including serpentinites and olivines, which are actually very abundant in Australia and all over the world. We then pre-process uh, the minerals to make them extra reactive. And then we pass uh, CO2 or even raw flue gas from an industrial source through our reactor and our process. Uh, and then that creates two main outputs, magnesium carbonate or calcium carbonate and silica. And then those products we then process into materials for the building industry or also other high value products. Um, and in particular, we're focusing on a, a plasterboard product, which is a negative emissions building material and a cement product where we're working with large industrial um, product companies on new formulations that have low carbon, um, low carbon embedded properties. And uh, there's a lot of information on the slides. I've put it here because then people can read it afterwards because I know it will be publicly available. The industry for carbon utilization has been estimated to be worth almost 6 trillion US dollars. And this was already in 2017. We expect that that number will have grown substantially. Um, so there is a, quite a lot of money to be made out of turning waste, CO2 and industrial wastes into new products. And so we're, we're hoping to be a big part of that. Um, so the products that we produce, um, as I mentioned, amorphous silica, calcium carbonate, I'll just go through these quickly, but you can see the range of products uh, on the screen as well. Um, we, uh, we're working with the largest companies in the world on some of these formulations and including applications in climate mitigation and adaptation technologies together, things like seawalls and land reclamation, which are, would be of interest to some of the Asian um, applications. Now I've popped here some of the mineral feedstocks that are the most uh, exciting and the most scalable for us in the world. Uh, and we have, we're scouting a fair number of projects in Asia, uh, in Japan, in, um, in Vietnam, uh, Thailand, a, a number of different countries all around the world. So if, um, if this is something of interest to you, please do get in touch because we are, um, we're deep in, in um, deciding what our next best um, place to build a plant is. And yes, the industrial waste feedstocks, they look just like this. Now um, you can see behind me and also in this um, plant, this is our, um, our pilot plant that we built in, um, came, came online in 2016. And we've been running it every day and producing the materials that I just showed you. And uh, that's been really exciting to validate at technology readiness level six. Uh, and we've been doing that in a lot of research secrecy so far and have just started to really tell our story in the last, two years and uh, the, the, um, the momentum is certainly building. Next, we will be um, building the demonstration plant. That's what we got our grant for. And uh, that is expected to be commissioned and turned online in July, 2023, which is you know not too far away. And uh, we are definitely getting cracking on that. That will be processing around 1,000 to 3,000 tonnes of CO2 per annum. And that's producing you know maybe 10,000 tonnes of building materials and, uh, and other products. So it's a, a validation of the technology at the scale we need in order to scale up into our next um, big plant, which will be um, TRL level eight. And um, we're looking to roll that out by 2027. And as I said, we're looking, you know, that may be in Japan, for instance, it may be in Australia, it may be in the US, 
in the UK, in, in many other places. So we've had a number of um, big wins recently. Um, one of them, we've, we've done many techno-economic validations with customers and, um, and we've been able to showcase that we are actually able to reduce the carbon intensity of industrial um, of industrial settings by a substantial amount, like in the, in more than 80%, for instance, and also make money at the same time. And that was validated by the um, CO2 utilization roadmap that Dan Quinn mentioned. Actually, one of the, um, the summaries in that roadmap said that mineral carbonation can lock away 19 million tonnes of CO2 per annum in Australia over 10 um, facilities, but also that that could be making a profit of $100 per tonne. Now, when you're looking at the cost of CCS, um, we're looking at creating um, a value proposition, a profit out of CO2. And so it makes um, the two different technologies, um, you know, just that they've got um, different features. And uh, yeah, we have, we're um, looking at investment coming in this year. So um, watch out for some big announcements there. We also won the Net Zero Technology Center COP26 pitch battle in, um, in Glasgow at the end of last year, which was a um, massive um, support for the momentum and the scalability of the technology that we're building here. Now, the thing is that our platform is so scalable that we can integrate into uh, a steel plant, a cement plant, into um, chemicals uh, as we're doing in Newcastle with Orica. And we can produce a variety of outputs like plasterboards and cements and seawalls and many other things that we're in development on. And so that's why I think our technology has been getting quite a lot of attention recently. And uh, I just popped this in because I thought some of our Asian counterparts would enjoy that we made it into the Nikkei Times last year when we first started our MOU partnership with, with Itochu. And finally, I'll leave you with a bit of vision, which is uh, this is what a 1 million tonne mineral carbonation plant will look like. This is next to a steel facility. Um, and uh, this is, we'll be processing a million tons of CO2. We're hoping to get something like that online from 2027 onwards. Thank you very much for listening. Thank, thank you so much, Sophia, for uh, your excellent presentation. Also the uh, practical experience of your company. I think this is a very exciting that uh, uh, we, we should learn from, from the, uh, this uh, experience because I think your company very impressed in terms of, you mentioned that even without government policy support, the company already makes some profit because you able to sell your products. This is very important. And this work is will, I think, uh, contribute largely to the circular, circular economy because you use a material, which is a waste of uh, industrial product and others, which is, and then use this with uh, recycling with the uh, CO two, and then you make a very excellent product for use. This is a very excellent work. I, I think we we will learn more from you. And uh, thank you, by the way. And with, without further ado, I would like to invite the next speaker, uh, Darren Creer, a general manager uh, on carbon transport and storage. Uh, he, he going to present, I think, one of the exciting. Uh, technology on CCUS, how this uh, in terms of carbon captures and storage uh, uh, will be uh, uh, practiced and stored in the Surin Basin, one of the light basin in Queensland. And uh, Darren, the floor is yours, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Berman. Uh, so I'll just give you a, tonight a, uh, a just a quick project update on Glencore's uh, CTSCO CCS project in the Surat Basin. So the CTSCO project includes two major components. Um, the, uh, the, the most expensive part of our project uh, and is the capture part of our project. So uh, the, 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 the current project that we're working on uh, involves the, the building and operation of a demonstration scale CO2 ca capture plant, a post-combustion capture plant uh, at an existing coal-fired power station. And we've partnered with 
the Mumerin power station um, in the Surat Basin, which is close to the storage location. Uh, and the second, uh, and, this, and the, probably the most significant part of our project is the storage component of our project. Um, so the second part involves the transportation and storage of CO2 um, in, in the Surat Basin. Um, at, at this stage, and I'll run you through the two parts of those projects in the next, um, in the next couple of slides, but uh, we're currently seeking uh, Queensland environmental approval to, uh, to store that CO2, and that's the last hurdle we have before the project um, is, in, is in full scale. Uh, we, we currently anticipate having those approvals um, early, uh, by the end of this year or early, early into next year, and we expect to be... Um, in uh, injecting our first CO2 um, into the reservoir in uh, 2024. So the, um, the, the purpose of the project and the purpose of the, the capture part of the project, um, first and foremost, is to provide us with a source of CO2 for the storage demonstration. Uh, and, and the second, but also significant part of the, uh, of the project is to advance CO2 capture technology. Uh, only by doing more of this technology are we going to improve it um, and uh, and, and to improve the cost of, of, uh, of, of capturing CO2. Um, and, 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 for, and for our case here, we're capturing it from an existing uh, fossil fuel generation. Uh, the second part of the project is to verify a large scale CO2 storage basin that can be used by, by industry. So that's generators, power generators, uh, other industrial emitters, and, uh, and also we're looking at potential uh, blue hydrogen projects, so coal or gas to, uh, to hydrogen projects. Uh, the, the project is less about proving the technical viability of the storage site, but it's more about getting regulatory certainty for storage. Um, there's been no large scale storage of CO2 in Queensland and having the regulatory and community certainty to be able to do that is important for people to invest in capture technology in the future. Um, in doing the demonstration, we'll, we'll also develop um, large scale uh, or provide large scale long term cost effective storage for CO2 that's close to source and, and I'll show you a map in a couple of slides that show you show you where we are compared to source. Um, and finally, in everything that we do, we have an eye to um, to the, the industrial scale nature of the project in the future. So the, the demonstration scale project is providing that foundation storage infrastructure for future large scale storage. So the, on the capture side, um, the, the technology that we've selected for our demonstration scale project is Huanang Seri's uh, post-combustion capture plant. It's an Amin power station. We've been working with, um, with, uh, with, with Seri, uh, the Huanang group, for, for nearly 10 years. Um, the, the technology, the plant that we're going to use um, is a demonstration, demonstration scale uh, capture plant. We'll be capturing just 110,000 tonnes per year, which is enough for us to do the... Uh, the, the CO2 injection demonstration that we need to do. Um, the plant is will be the sister plant to Huaneng's um, Shanghai Shidonku uh, post-combustion capture plant. That plant's been successfully operating in, uh, in, uh, in Shanghai, providing CO2 to the industrial market for since 2009. So we have, from a technology perspective, it's a low technology risk for the project. Um, our plant, our project will initially run for three years. That's the demonstration component before we seek approval to do um, industrial scale storage. Um, the, the plant itself, though, has a life beyond the three-year demonstration project. Our plant will be designed for a twenty-year life, so it, it will have a life beyond uh, beyond our demonstration project. Um, the plant will be majority constructed in China um, and then in modules and, and, uh, and then shipped to Australia for, uh, for construction on site. Uh, we've completed project feed. We've also uh, completed a, a range of early works tasks at the power station, including the cut-ins at the power station and have commenced purchasing long, long lead items for, for that plant. Uh, the picture on the left is, the, uh, is a picture of the, uh, the Shidonku ca capture plant in Shanghai. And on the right is that is that same plant modified to fit onto the um, onto the western side of the Mumerin power station? Go on to the storage side. Um, our storage reservoir is uh, is located in the Surat Basin in Queensland, so we're about we're about three hundred kilometres west of Brisbane. Um, the the our storage uh, our license area is enormous. It's nearly thirty nearly thirty seven hundred square kilometres. 
Um, it's, it's close to existing transport infrastructure. There's, uh, there's existing oil and gas uh, pipelines and pipeline routes that run right through the project area. Um, those project uh, those pipeline routes run run to the coast, so it opens up the 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 prospect of potentially importing liquid CO two from elsewhere and bringing it to site. Um, closer to home, it's it's close to three of Australia's youngest power station, uh, coal fired power stations, but also a range of other uh, gas fired power stations and industrial sources in the Surat Basin. Um, we, we're also close to uh, a, a number of projects that are currently looking at um, at blue hydrogen. Uh, the tenure is held 100% by Glencore. Um, it's currently the only um, active greenhouse gas exploration uh, tenement in Queensland, uh, but it won't be the last. Um, the Queensland government recently released uh, a, a number of additional tenements um, around this tenement um, and, also, and also further afield in Queensland. Um, the tenement itself, um, based on the appraisal work that we've done, um, we believe will have a, uh, a usable storage capacity in excess of half a billion tonnes. Um, and, uh, and, and I'll talk a little more about the cost of, of storing CO2 in this sort of environment and, and the work that we've done so far. But um, it's a, um, it, we see it as, a, as a, not only a large storage capacity, but also a high rate storage reservoir as well. So capable of injecting large volumes of CO2. So we're looking at um, cases where we could potentially inject 10 million tonnes per annum for, for over 30 years um, into that storage area. So the, over the last two years, we've been appraising the storage area. There's, there's a range of, um, uh, there's, there's very few penetrations of the reservoir, which is a good thing from a storage integrity perspective. Um, but there's a, there's, there, is, there is some uh, exploration, legacy exp oil and gas exploration across the area in a large uh, seismic data set. Um, in 2020 and 2021, we went and drilled appraisal wells um, in the reservoir. Um, the aim of that was to determine whether we had a viable storage reservoir and, and, and out of that we, we, we found an outstanding reservoir. So we're looking at depths of about 2.3 kilometres. Um, we've got a, a thick and very permeable multi-Darcy uh, reservoir into a saline aquifer um, with an outstanding seal above us. Um, this, uh, so from a storage perspective, this ticked all the boxes for, for, a, uh, for an excellent storage uh, reservoir both capacity-wise and rate-wise. Uh, we've got uh, uh, permeabilities uh, in excess of four Darcy. Um, the mechanism we'll use for trapping CO2 is solution trapping. Uh, we're not relying on a structure uh, and we have a very large area to store CO2. Um, the, the, um, uh, and and on the, the, the right picture on the right there is a picture of, um, of the exploration drilling rig that we drilled. Though that well was um, completed as the future um, uh, injection well. And the uh, the second one we went back and drilled uh, was completed as the uh, as as the, one of the future monitoring wells. Um, we're looking at having the ability to inject um, in excess of a million tons per year into a single well. So from an infrastructure and cost perspective, well, we we believe it's a, it's an outstanding place to store CO two. Um, the, the picture in the middle is a uh, is a schematic of the demonstration project that we're proposing, where we'll inject. Um, up to 110,000 tonnes of CO2 per year uh, and monitor it. Um, we, we're using uh, technology uh, that was, uh, that's been proven around the world. Um, we have really good links with a number of projects around the world. Um, we have uh, friends in the Tomokamai project um, in Japan, uh, and we've been able to share a lot of learnings with them um, and take on board um, a lot of their learnings in terms of monitoring and verification. Uh, and also with our friends in Canada at the Aquastore project at Boundary Dam for both the capture side of the project and also the, the injection side of the project. So my last slide is just the pathway to large scale CCS. At the end of the day, the demonstration is nice, but, but the end game here is in short term to have a large scale um, CO2 storage uh, hub at, in the Surat Basin. So the demonstration project provides the reference case for future large scale development and deployment of CCS. Um, it allows us to prove the monitoring technology um, in that environment um, and set the pathway for large scale injection approvals, regulatory approvals. Um, the, uh, it, it allows us to demonstrate effective post-combustion capture on an existing power station um, and, and importantly, um, lay the foundation infrastructure for future large scale storage. Um, 
as part of the Australian government's technology roadmap, they set a target of, of under $20 a tonne for captured CO2. And that $20 a tonne doesn't include the capture, it includes the CO2 compression, transport and storage. We've run a number of, um, of uh, uh, technical cases and a number of economic cases looking at um, what the cost of storage, uh, so comp CO2 compression, pipeline transport and storage would look like in the Surat Basin. And I've, and I've listed one case there um, of a greenfield project, so a new project from scratch, 2 million tonnes of CO2 per year, a 100 kilometre pipeline that gets us to, gets us to two of the three close power stations in the region. Um, full CO2 compression, so from atmospheric right up to injection pressure, 20 year project life and full monitoring. Um, and uh, using, using the, um, the current um, cost of electricity in Queensland, um, that turns out to be Australian $17 a tonne for the CO2 stored. Um, depending on the case that we use and the power price that we assume, um, that can be as low as $13 a tonne for CO2 stored. So um, the project that we're doing now is, the, is that reference case and that next step in, in getting a large scale industrial hub in the Surat Basin with uh, costs substantially less than $17 a tonne for CO2 compressed transport and stored. And that's my last slide, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. you finished, right? Okay. Uh, and thank you so much, Darren for excellent presentation on this, uh, which will lead uh, scalable CC uh, in Australia as well in Asia to, I think, better understanding and uh, to, to have regulator to understand well in terms of safety, in terms of environmental issue and other, I think this will give more confident in the next level that we able to, I think, provide a, a very confident policy support to CCUS. I think uh, uh, we hope that we learn a lot from your presentation, but let's see uh, what question will come up uh, from the uh, participant. Uh, thank you again, Darren, for this uh, presentation. Uh, next, I would like to invite uh, Director Suksakorn uh, P. Levan. Uh, the director of energy uh, uh, from law department to make a comment on the three presentation briefly, uh, how your interest, how particularly impression on those, uh, this uh, experience from Australia that can be applied to ASEAN particularly or to Lao context. The floor is your uh, director, Suksakorn. Thank you so much, Dr. Humin. And uh, thank you, the Australian government, for sharing us your CCUS history development, as well as the current development in the CCUS technology in Australia, which are very practical. And many things that I've seen as a new technology today, especially at the uh, the solar capture, the solar and uh, direct capture, which is, uh, I've never heard about this before. And then the, uh, the processing uh, carbon dioxide into the other products, means with the other products, as well as we can see that the government, Australian government really uh, making great efforts and contribution in the, in realizing its vision to be carbon neutrality. And the uh, government of Australia is really spending a lot of uh, huge budget, a huge budget into supporting this program, as well as the investor or scientists in this area. And I, I, I'm really amazed by this uh, action of the Australian government. And of course, for Southeast Asia, especially in Laos, <laughs> And um, I, Australia technology is really uh, interest, interesting to me. Uh, Laos is a landlocked country. Laos PDR is a landlocked country. And, you know, uh, we haven't found our potential storage. First one, we haven't done any concrete survey on the potential storage. 
then of course our area is uh, is mountainous is mountainous and then that that is one uh, uh, major challenge that is one major challenge that the government may, may face the difficulty then uh, the uh, the the presentation from from Miss Vance very <laughs> It is really giving me uh, the Lao. Maybe I, I myself personally think that that's one way of the whole for the Lao government to really promote CCUS technology. You know, uh, if we can really uh, turn carbon dioxide. Into. But uh, so far, our carbon dioxide reduction uh, as satisfied by uh, the world in data, the world in data showing that we produce approximately. Uh, for, uh, 40 million tons of carbon dioxide uh, each year, approximately. And that um, now to the experience that um, I hope uh, really the, uh, uh, I, Laos is a land or country and then our, sur our surrounding neighbors, they even have advanced technology than Laos and maybe uh, what I would like to uh, uh, really hope for some uh, uh, advice from the Australian government, especially from Mr. Queen, uh, what can really Laos uh, take the first initiative in order to really, you know, bring in, uh, to, to build a foundation to really attract investor, uh, in, in the, given the fact that we are landlocked, but how, however, we uh, in the center and where you know the uh, where the production of uh, 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 the, the technology that uh, can bring uh, into Laos, what what really one one will be the technology that uh, uh, the CCUS technology that the uh, Lao government should should really focus on in promoting. You know, given the fact that we are landlocked and we are, we are mountainous, our transportation is very limited, and and, and uh, many uh, road conditions are still on the part of improvement or expansion. So that's the, the, the first thing is maybe your advice for the local government, and and of course the and and to Miss Sophie. Uh, Thank you. Uh, congratulations with the uh, Sophia, the award winning, COP award winning of your. I, I really, you know, uh, if possible, if area, I think uh, I myself, and, uh, as well as the, my uh, ASEAN colleagues, maybe would like to know as well how really uh, your company, Ms. Bank, really, you know, when you turn CCUS into products and how you sell those products to the markets, to your optics. Uh, 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 if possible, maybe we, you can share us your experience, how you really do business. And maybe if not enough time today, maybe uh, we should uh, give specific lecture on really, you know, how to help people sell their products when they turn uh, the, the CEO to into the other products or, you know. Then that that's one, one one thing that maybe today you can give us some brief answer, but of course that will be if possible. The next session, fully scale section for this will be is to very good. And uh yes, uh Mr. Chubek, Chusek, Chusek, sorry. And is there any environmental concerns? Uh, because uh, even though I, I have seen in, in many countries when they do these uh, solar panels. Uh, for example, the experience of the US, you know, the solar panels produce heat and then they have some effects on the birds. <laughs> but whether there will be any environmental concern regarding this, uh, your, uh, your solar air direct capture. And what, what are the mitigation that, that can the Southeast Asia where we are also abandoned source of solar energy can really uh, should really take into account and you know the way to mitigate this uh, if, if there is any such uh, environmental concern issues and to the Queensland and we have uh, I, uh, we have one uh, coal-fired power plants in the eastern part of Laos and it's 1,800 megawatts 
and then the law government is also building another one in the southern part that's also another 900 megawatts and, and another two more in the come in, in this decade um what what would be in order to integrate uh, to mr cray cray uh, darren cray uh, to really integrate this your technology with the uh, uh with the Co-fire power plants. What what really the co-fire power plant has to uh, to to make space for you for to to prepare in order to really integrate this source of technology with with the uh, co-fire power plants. And of course, I still have a lot of questions to go. But uh, since the time limits, and thank you so much. But as long as you can give any comments, I'm I'm, I'm happy with them. Yeah, even though they don't have to be that very clear. For this day but i'm looking forward that area will make another arrangement for you know greater details in, in many areas that from australian experience thank you so much thank, thank you so much director Suksukon. i think you made very nice comment to all the three uh excellent presenter but i think to maybe we can pick up one uh, uh each uh to respond to uh some question from uh, uh, Director Subsakorn. I think uh, to perhaps first to Julian, I think he's concerned if he, any environmental impact when using solar to as an energy to, to run these uh, uh, direct air captures. Uh, could you please clarify to him quickly on, on those points? And then I will come to Sophia here. Yeah. Uh, yes, it's a good question. Uh, we, we haven't given it a lot of thought in the context of direct air capture. Uh, I mean, Australia has an immense and building solar utility scale solar PV industry where, you know, I think we've already got, you know, three gigawatts of rooftop solar and we're about to build with our energy transition, many, many more gigawatts of solar. There's a project that North Territory Sun cable that's proposed for 20 gigawatts of solar. Uh, so I think it's, yeah, if there is a industry question on the environmental impact of solar, uh, we need to answer it as almost not just an Australian community, but a global community, uh, recognizing of course, that no energy source is perfect. Uh, and uh, <laughs> there's a reason to say that no to pretty much everything, but we, the, the world needs energy, so we've got to figure out which ones have the uh, the least footprint, and how do we ensure that we do what we need to do uh, with with the smallest footprint possible. So I, I know that's not a direct answer to uh, the the impact of solar, but I, I think it's a broader question than just relating to direct air capture. Uh, that the scale of the renewable energy rollout in Australia is is just staggering. And uh, if there is an environmental issue, we need to answer it for, uh, for utility scale solar, uh, which will be many, many, many magnitudes of, of, of solar panels beyond uh, what Zach's doing in the next sort of 10 years. So it's not a, not a direct answer to the environmental issues, but it's just, we, we, we need to have a look at that in more detail. Thank, thank you so much, Julian, uh, for, for your brief uh, uh, response to, uh, uh, Director Subsakon. I think let's move to Sophia. I think one of the questions from Director Subsakon is how are you going to make your product to the market? This will be one of the critical that uh, business model that you have highlighted without the government support, but this company already making profit. Could you please uh, share that experience? Thing? Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Fumin. So there's three key things that we need to be successful with MCI's technology. We need a source of CO2. We need a mineral feedstock. So an industrial waste or um, virgin rock that can be quarried. And then we need the local markets to buy the product, as you, as you mentioned. These three things need to be within 100 kilometers of each other in order for us to make a profit and for the carbon economics to work. Otherwise, you waste too much CO2 with transport, for instance. So 
the way that we work with Asia right now is we do an investigation of where the feedstocks exist and where has a CO2 source where they're already capturing, hopefully, the CO2 or they have the ability to capture CO2. And then we look at the local markets and we think, hey, do they like to um, buy cement here or is this the plasterboard place or could we make paper or, or other materials? And those things together um, in, a, in a changeable and movable way, even if it's near a port, then that means that that changes the dynamic again. That means that uh, that's how we investigate if we have a business model in that region. And that 100 kilometers will change year by year. But right now, that's how we look at different projects in places like Vietnam or Thailand, et cetera. Um, and that means that the offtake partners, then we, we look at them and we say, hey, would you buy low carbon, um, th these low carbon property products? And then we look at the price that they'll pay. And it's um, there's no shortage of um, companies looking to purchase our low carbon materials. I have to say it's, it's very exciting. Thank you so much, Sophia, for this uh, very valuable experience of how you, you, you really uh, think out the whole uh, markets and from the, the, from the how you make the product more, uh, I think, uh, sought out in terms of the proximity of the feedstock uh, collection, transport and other in order to ensure that you make profit. This is, I think, very practical and value experience to, uh, I think, our stakeholder in ASEAN. Thank you, uh, Sophie, and, for and this. And by the way, sorry, yeah. just one more thing. Um, if there is to be a carbon price, mm -hmm. like in Australia, we're developing a ERF methodology for CCU, that price or a carbon, uh, an international or voluntary carbon price can be added on to the business model at the end. Um, and it, it is an extra nice to have, um, but it's not a part currently, not a part of our, um, our business model. We need to make profit without it. That's great, Sophia. That's great to hear that. I mean, that to make a fast return if government really have, yeah, on, on those carbon price. I think the next uh, will be one question to Darren from the directors, uh, Suksukon. I think how he, pre uh, he want advice from you basically because uh, in Laos there will the current power plant is the Hong Sa power plant. It's uh, with already running with uh, 1,800 uh, megawatts, uh, and then another come with uh, 900 megawatt in southern parts. So I think emission will be very large as Laos one of the small country. But I think most of the power plant for export, but. What will be your recommendation to have integrate CCUS at the plant side? And what will be your recommendation from your project experience? Uh, Darren, your, the floor is yours, please. So I think there's a couple of aspects to that. I think the first is um, uh, post-combustion capture is very much a, um, a modular technology. So you don't have to capture all your, uh, spend the money to, to build a plant to capture everything on day one. You can you can build um, capture trains and then and build up so you don't have to invest all your money on the first day. Um, so you have the option for that. Um, I mean, ultimately, the you, you need to get there's, there's a couple of things you need from your power plant to run a post combustion capture plant. You need to get the CO2 or the the flue gas to the power to to the post combustion capture plant. Um, you need to be able to return the um, the the lean. Gap flue gas, so the C, the, C, the CO two removed flue gas back to the power station. You usually need some sort of steam for the process, uh, which you can either make yourself um, or you can take off the power station. For at Milmerin, we take it off at uh, between the uh, between the two lower stages of uh, of one of the um, turbines. It's we take it at its at its lowest value, um, and then large, last you need a little bit of electricity. I think the key thing um, to do it at scale at a power plant is to pick the technology that gives you the lowest parasitic load. Ultimately, um, as Julia mentioned, nothing comes for free. Um, in thermodynamics, you, you, the, the, there is a power penalty for, uh, for capturing CO2. You have to run plants. So, so ultimately, 
picking a, um, a technology that gives you that lowest parasitic load. Um, and there's a number of companies um, around the world that we're aware of that are working on that um, through, through different um, solvent technologies, um, through different technologies. I mean, the, 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 the partners that we have in SERI are currently working on a promising technology that has, has the potential to make um, a, a step change in, in, that, um, in, in that parasitic load. Um, and and uh, I won't steal their thunder. I'll let them present some another time on their on their technology. But they've they've piloted that technology, that Shidonku plant that we showed you before. They've retrofitted that plant with that new technology, and, and in the coming months, that could be uh, an, an exciting um, uh, development for them to present to a forum as well. And thank you so much, uh, Darren, for your uh, recommendation to 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 Lao particularly. I think uh, Director Susakon may be very happy to receive this uh, practical recommendation uh, from Darren. I think let me run through the question. I already re uh, received several questions in the Q&A and chat box. Let me uh, read out those. Um, and uh, I think the first question uh, go to, to, Ju to Julia, Julian. Uh, could direct air capture go with coal power plant for greenhouse gas reduction in the high solar potential? And also a an connection question, when that technology can be commercialized? Uh, could you please uh, quickly address this question, Julian? Uh, sure, thank you. And uh, I think there was another question with uh, the Diego. Yes. Uh, Vaquez also okay, answered. Okay, please so, combine with that. Uh, yeah, please combine with that. With the government's objective of twenty dollars per ton, given that direct air capture you can place anywhere because the CO two concentration is the same, there's no point trying to chase slightly higher CO two concentration, and that doesn't help our equation really. Most of the energy involved in direct air capture is about desorbing the CO two, not absorbing it. It's how do you release the CO two? Uh, once it's uh, once it's absorbed, so there's no point chasing extra CO2 concentration. If you've got a coal-fired plant, you put in post-combustion capture as per the Darren Darren CTS co project. If you've got direct air capture, you want to get to the point where you can minimise that cost of transport storage compression all the way around. Sorry, compression transport storage. And the way to do that is to locate actually at the storage site because then your transport cost is zero and all you've got is compression and storage. So it makes it uh, more likely that you can reach your $20, the government's $20 a ton target is better able to be reached if you co-locate direct air capture at the storage hub itself. I think that I've wrapped in with that answer most of the the commentary and the question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, th th thank, thank you so much, Julian, for, for that response. And uh, next, I think I'm the sorry. question. I didn't answer, sorry, I didn't answer the when question. Yes, uh, please. So we're trying to get the whole idea of, as I said before, of direct air capture coming to lower cost is to get to scale. So we're about to commercialize the first project in, it'll be the first project in the Southern Hemisphere, one ton a day. And then, but we want to get to a million tons per year. Uh, maybe by the end of the decade, ideally 2030, it's a long way away, but that's kind of what we're aiming for. Uh, we do that by scaling up. So we want to get a thousand tons a year online by 2024, 5,000 ton a year by about 25, and then a 20,000 ton, then a hundred thousand ton, then in a million ton. And that, if we do that over the over the span of the decade, once we get to a million tons, or maybe even a hundred thousand tons, we'll be at the hundred dollar a ton on our current economic projection. So we, we're effectively we're following what Climeworks is doing. They're currently at four thousand. We imagine that their next scale up will be five times that. I don't know. We're just a few years behind, but we're using solar powered and we're using a disruptive absorbent called the MOF. Uh, so that might help us get there a bit quicker. Thanks for the question. Very good question. Thank you so much, Julian, for, for that response. Uh, I, there are also questions from Juho. 
I think uh, everyone knows Juho, by the way, uh, Liponen. Uh, his question is about the, uh, uh, to Sophia. He said, your approach sounds great. Can you talk more about the CO2 reduction impact of your technology? How does this dif differ between the different end product you can offer? Uh, Sophia, could you please respond quickly on that? Yeah. It's a great question. And uh, the CO2 properties are different for every material. Um, the, the thing that gets the public the most excited is our cement blocks, right? This product has a 30% reduction in CO2 uh, footprint, which means that for every one ton of CO2, or for every one ton of um, cement produced, 300 kilograms of CO2 doesn't go into the atmosphere. So this is a, a reduction in CO2. However, for our um, plasterboard product, this is a negative emissions building material. So more CO2 is embedded into this product than was burnt in the creation of it. So um, this is a negative emissions material and the other is a low emissions material. Now, as we um, choose the products that we use, there will be different um, a different footprint and it'll highly be dependent on the local markets that buy it. But we can range from negative, which is the best, all the way to a reduction, which is still a 30% reduction in cement emissions is substantial. So um, yeah, we also have products like paper and carpet and, um, and low emissions glass or all kinds of things like that. So I'm happy to talk in more detail um, directly. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Sophia. In connection, I think there are a question to you also from there go in terms of the, could you please confirm the cost? Is, is it 100 US dollar per ton that the plan you talk about? So we, that, that's profit. So for instance, the, the example that I gave is, um, is the projections of our techno-economic feasibility. Sorry for the, um, for the lingo, but um, we are projecting that we would be making, you know, $100 per tonne of CO2 um, locked away at, at the scales that we're talking about there. So that's not cost, but profit. Thank, thank, thank you so much, uh, Sophia, for, for that response. To, again, to Darren, uh, the question is from there go. Your story size seem really attractive, capacity, injecting wise. Any other consideration related to uh, containment and the monitoring verification of that? So another good question. And when it comes to CO2 storage um, containment, it's all about containment. Um, any leaking any CO2 is is a is a is a disaster. So uh, the the geology where we are is is um, from a containment perspective makes it a very low risk proposition to store CO2. Uh, it's an area with um, with uh, with with no faults. Um, it's an area with um, a very thick seal um, and multiple seals above it. So from a, from a leakage perspective and a containment perspective, the, it's, it's an ideal place. Uh, the, the monitoring is, is, uh, is a big part of the demonstration project. At the end of the day, um, when we first started looking at, C at CCS in, in the Strat Basin 10 years ago, a lot of the monitoring technique, techniques were, were, were relatively new. They're now well proven. Um, so, so, but demonstrating that, to, to work in our setting is very important. So um, the, the monitoring techniques that we're focusing on uh, are things like time-lapse seismic, um, monitoring wells, a small number of monitoring wells, but monitoring wells with, um, with fiber optics. Uh, and there's a whole range of technologies that we'll, we'll employ. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, being able to monitor that for regulators and for, for the community, uh, particularly with an onshore storage project is very important. Thank, thank you, Darren. Just a quick connection that the question from Hong Wan Tan. Hmm. He also asked that what is the 17 Australian dollar per ton sale to storage mean? This so is a comeback or payback time? Yes, it's, it's, a, 
so the, the case that I showed, the seventeen dollars a ton, um, was for for one particular case, and it's the it's the cost for storage. So it includes all capex, all opex, and it also incorporates a, a reasonable um, cost of capital, and that'll depend on the on 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 your own company's cost of capital. Um, and uh, so in terms of payback time, that'll depend on what sort of carbon credits that you've got. But that $17 is a, is a, is a full life cycle cost for, for, for storage for the, for the one case that I showed there, which was, which was the industrial case, which is the one to two million tonnes uh, per annum for, for, uh, at a distance of about 100 kilometres transport. So um, that, that, that was that case, but it's a, it's a full life cycle cost and payback duration would depend on your cost of capital, but also what other carbon credits you're receiving. Thank you so much, uh, Darren, for a nice response to this. Uh, just uh, one back to Sophia, I think, uh, because they are putting question, both question uh, and answer in chat box and also in the chat box. So another question from Kusti Simon, he asked to Sophia about uh, if any environmental regulation to use this uh, low carbon product, uh, which is carbon recycling from, from your products. A any regulation about that to use your product? Can you please uh, respond to that? Yes. So the industry and the, um, the ecosystem is still unfolding to an extent. So we've been working with large um, materials companies and mining companies to validate the safety and the environmental um, efficacy, efficacy of our products, including um, the making sure that the CO2 is locked away into the product for 10,000 years. And we'll be working with the Australian government on the ERF methodology on that, and also with the other companies, but the environmental regulations and, um, and the ecosystem will be extremely important because the, uh, we need all technologies in the CCUS field to have integrity and safety and to be truly low emissions or negative emissions. So um, having a proper framework and scaffolding around the safety of these products will be of utmost importance. And I'd love to hear from any of the other um, government um, representatives in the room on, on if there's any plans for that. But right now we're just focusing on trying to get the products um, made. Yeah. Thank you, Sophia, uh, for your response. It's very nice to hear that. And I think we are reaching to the time of this uh, panel discussion. And uh, I think I would like to take this opportunity to uh, thank all the three speakers for your excellent contribution to this uh, the panel discussion. Also, I would like to thank the Director Suskon from Laos to make very nice and practical comment on the experience from Australia. And I believe that this session will contribute greatly to the future development of CCUS in Asia, particularly ASEAN. And also, I think the direct air capture uh, from solar. This is very interesting. And then I think the, uh, this technology is promising and hope it uh, can be deployed at very large scale to bring down the cost. I think it's one of other complementary a pathway toward, uh, I think, uh, to the CCUS toward the uh, net zero emission by 2050. I think we call the time limit. I, I know that there will be more questions and they want to hear more about you, your work. I think perhaps we need to organize more of this to share our knowledge and experience to ensure that we we able to deploy this technology and make sure that this can be commercialized and we're very exciting to hear the case from Australia, very, very great experience. And I want to uh, conclude this session by thanking all the three presenters, uh, Julian, Sophia, Darren, and also uh, Director Suksakon for your great contribution to this session. And uh, thank you so much, by the way, and have a nice day. And I want to turn the floor back to our MC, Dean, the floor is back to you. And also thank them very much for, for overall support to this, uh, uh, this uh, conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Furman, for leading the interesting and fruitful discussion of the session.
So before we end today's conference, now I call upon Mr. Shigeru Kimura, a special mm -hmm. advisor to the President on Energy Affairs area, to say a few words for closing remarks. Mm -hmm. Please, Mr. Kimura, the screen is yours. Uh, <coughs> thank you very much, Diane, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, Australian is a part, uh, speakers for your excellent uh, presentations. Uh, firstly, uh, Mr. Dan Quinn is uh, touch upon the Australian experience on the uh, CCS, is a uh, focus on the uh, policy. And uh, we we surely understand the uh, Australian CCS policy is consists of the uh, four pillars. First one is a CCS hub and the technology program. And the CCS Development Fund is uh, Australia is uh, uh, allocated the uh, 50 Australian, uh, 50 million Australian dollars for CCS activities. And the third one is uh, uh, geological storage potential is uh, hopefully 20 million tons of CO2 in Australia and research and science. So this uh, uh, under the research and science periods, I think that the uh, uh, following three projects is uh, uh, presented by the uh, three Australian uh, speakers is uh, uh, included in the uh, uh, science, research and the science uh, activi activities. So that uh, CCS uh, project uh, in Australia is uh, well ongoing, uh, successfully uh, due to the uh, strong support of the Australian government. It is, uh, this is uh, one outcome from the, uh, this uh, 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 knowledge sharing. And uh, I move on to the, uh, uh, touch upon the uh, uh, three project. Firstly is uh, uh, Mr. Julian uh, kindly introduced the Australian uh, project is uh, uh, of the uh, solar powered direct uh, captured. I think that uh, I'm now in, uh, in charge of the uh, preparation of carbon neutral scenario in the Asian countries, ASEAN countries, so that, that 2050, that this kind of the target year of the carbon neutral, uh, car, uh, direct air capture technology should be uh, needed, will be needed. So that uh, this uh, project is a very, very uh, uh, relevant and timely. And, uh, and also the uh, uh, change to the promising technologies in the futures. Then uh, DAC is a uh, consume a lot of electricity because the uh, uh, breathe the lot of airs using the uh, pump. So that uh, DAC need electricity, but uh, 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 Australia or a uh, carbon, uh, corporate carbon idea is using the uh, uh, electricity from solar PV, it is a very clean uh, electricity so that no emissions and uh, uh, correct the uh, CO2. That is uh, re it's really negative emission. So that uh, uh, this project is very, very interesting for the uh, uh, Asian, uh, not for the uh, Japan and uh, Asian countries and the world. And uh, he mentioned about the uh, target uh, cost down to the uh, less than 100 US dollar per ton. Yeah, that is a uh, uh, very uh, challenging, challengeable, and uh, uh, I hope the uh, uh, really uh, achieve could achieve the uh, uh, this uh, target. Uh, anyway, it's a uh, really uh, uh, treatment is a uh, uh, reduction of CO2 applying the technology is costly. So that uh, uh, cost down is uh, uh, our very <laughs> uh, challenge and uh, uh, need to achieve. And also in this case, uh, somebody somebody say say uh, touch upon the uh, carbon price. Is carbon price is also support the uh, carbon reduction using the uh, technologies. And the second one is uh, uh, Sophia San is uh, introduced the uh, CCU. Utilization of carbon carbon uh, recycling, uh, catch the CO2 and uh, produce the uh, uh, construction materials. It's really good. And uh, also, the, this is uh, actual uh, negative emissions because the uh, uh, co uh, construction materials are never, never combust. 
Then another uh, carbon recycling is uh, producing the uh, synthetic fuels like uh, gasoline and uh, uh, diesels. That, but that is uh, finally uh, combust, <laughs> so that uh, uh, CO2 emit, but uh, uh, emission amount is uh, quite low. But, so that uh, I, I, I very support the uh, uh, MCI's activities is uh, changing, uh, producing the uh, uh, construction materials uh, uh, using the captured CO2. And uh, also, uh, he is uh, Sophia San touch upon the uh, cost of cost is very important. And the industry regard is uh, transportation uh, uh, distance should be e e e short. So that uh, that is uh, also uh, effect, effect to the uh, uh, cost down of the uh, uh, carbon recycling. And uh, finally, uh, Sophia San touch introduced us the uh, newspaper. Uh, Nikkei uh, newspapers. Uh, I, I also read the uh, that, that uh, <laughs> topics, and uh, Itochu uh, and uh, uh, signed them you with MCI. It's, Itochu is uh, really commercial companies, uh, business companies. So that uh, I think that uh, this is uh, uh, MCI's uh, activities is uh, now. Uh, uh, having the uh, receiving the uh, uh, Australian government support, uh, financial support, but uh, in the future, I think that the MCI will be a uh, uh, business oriented comp companies in terms of the uh, uh, CO2 capturing and also the producing the uh, uh, construction materials. That is, uh, uh, I hope. And the uh, third one is uh, uh, Glencore uh, uh, CCS project. Uh, presented by the uh, Mr. Darens. And uh, also he mentioned about the uh, cost down. It's, it's uh, 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 short of distance between the uh, source and uh, storage is it's, it's, it's a key point. So that, uh, so that, so that uh, I think that uh, uh, now he mentioned about the cost is uh, also, uh, 17 Australian dollar per CO2 ton. And, uh, we also uh, 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 calculate the, uh, uh, the CO2, uh, CCS cost uh, in uh, uh, Indonesia. And uh, but, but I, 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 we put the lot of assumption and uh, we get the uh, cost is around the uh, 60 US <laughs> dollars. So that <laughs> Australia is a uh, uh, Glencore uh, project is uh, much, much uh, interesting. So that uh, uh, we surely uh, refer to the uh, your project uh, carefully and uh, also. Uh, uh, get the uh, some uh, 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 useful information from the uh, your, your project, and uh, uh, this project is really focused on uh, is, uh, uh, catch CO two from the uh, uh, coal power plant. Then uh, uh, Mr. Sukhsafon is mentioned about the uh, Lao. Uh, Lao is basically a hydropower uh, uh, country, but uh, now increasing the uh, coal power plant. And uh, looking at the whole ASEAN, it's, uh, there are a lot of coal, coal power plant. So that uh, Glencore technologies uh, capture CO2 from the, from the coal power plant and uh, storage uh, into the underground. That is a uh, uh, very good uh, reference for the ASEAN, ASEAN countries. And uh, also uh, in this case, so, uh, monitoring and also the environmental regulation is very, very important to, to, to check the uh, leaking of the CO2 so that uh, uh, we are uh, really is, uh, here or uh, look, uh, continuously look at the uh, <laughs> <your> project, <laughs> uh, how to <laughs> uh, maintain the, uh, uh, to stop leaking of the CO2 in, in your project. But anyway, it's a uh, uh, whole project is uh, very, very interesting uh, for the uh, ASEAN countries. ASEAN countries and uh, Asian countries, uh, except the, uh, but anyway, it's uh, Japan uh, is now uh, uh, starting the uh, Tomakomai project. 
And Australia, uh, you have a lot of project, but uh, uh, ASEAN, ASEAN region, there's no project. So that's, uh, uh, and your area is uh, uh, Secretariat of the ACN, Justice uh, Network. Then uh, according to our vision, uh, uh, we set up the uh, CCS pilot project in ASEAN uh, around the year 2025. In this regard, uh, we area as a secretary of ACN, uh, referring to the uh, Australian experience, you have a lot of experience, the DAC and the C uh, carbon recycling and the CCS. And also the, uh, uh, you are watching to the uh, Tomago Mine project and also uh, US uh, project. Uh, based on the uh, ex uh, OECD countries, developed countries uh, experience and expertise, uh, we area is uh, uh, really uh, set up. Uh, we set up the uh, uh, CCS or CCU project in 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 ASEAN region around the uh, uh, 2025. That but that should be a pilot project uh, uh, set up uh, la launch or set up the that, that kind of uh, pilot project in 2025. Uh, thank, you, thank you again is uh, uh, for speakers from Australia and uh, uh, this uh, today's uh, uh, knowledge sharing is uh, uh, really uh, we, 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 we received a lot of good feedback from the Australian speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you again uh, everybody and uh, I flow, flow back to the uh, DM. Thank you, Mr. Kumara, for your closing speech. Therefore, we came to the end of today's conference. Thank you to all speakers and participants for your remarkable presentation and engagement. Please visit our website on www.asiacusnetwork.org to receive all news updates and upcoming Asia CCUS Networks event. Again, thank you very much for your participation. We are looking forward to seeing you in the upcoming knowledge sharing conference. With that, I close this today's conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Dia. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Jocelyn, thank you so much for arranging, uh, making this uh, director of SECON and uh, manager Dan. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yes.